I'm going to talk about integrating future therapies into routine care. Now, I'm not going to talk about new pills because we can integrate new pills into our routine care most of the time because that's what we're used to doing. I'm going to, uh, there's my disclosures. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, these ones in yellow, which are actually injectables. How do you integrate the injectables and the long-acting therapies that are about to come onto the onto our radar. Um, Viv have already had a, a, a press release for their shareholders to say the success of some of their injections and uh, there's going to be more and more data. So there's lots of stuff coming. Uh, not all of it will reach phase three and beyond, but there are injectables on the way. So why do people want long acting? Well, it prevents poor adherence. If you have something that lasts you uh, several months, then you have to take it. <laughs> Every day you're taking it. Uh, and uh, if it can be infrequent do infrequently dosed, that's positive. And there are some people who get pill fatigue, I'm fed up of taking tablets, or I don't like taking tablets, or injections must be better, mustn't they, doc? Right, so there's that. Uh, it might protect health privacy. In other words, you're not storing tablets at home that your kids, your relatives, or when you have friends around to your house and they put their coats upstairs in your room, they're having a little look in the drawers right before, <laughs> before they come down for a drink. Uh, and, and I'm going to describe a little bit later about overall in a year that you might have a lower drug dose. So what, will there be demand? Well, the big thing is this. You have more choice if you have long-acting, right? So if you look at the, the oral contraceptive pill, there's pills you can take every day. There are long-acting injectables, and there are, there are topical coils, implants, all sorts of things you can have which give women choice. And you can think that what injectables or long-acting formulations of any form will give HIV patients choice. So the most advanced long-acting formulations are cabotegravir, which is very similar to dolutegravir, and rilpivirine, which has been around a, a, a while. And there it is, and, they, um, and the treatment dose for cabotegravir is uh, going to be around 400 milligrams every four weeks, and for rilpivirine, 600 milligrams every four weeks. There it is, long-acting. And they've just described a study where they had people who were undetectable switch to this, uh, and 48 weeks later, uh, um, we've seen some success. But as I say, it's only in a press release so far. So I, I'm not going to go through all this, except for there are some really exciting compounds coming on. Gilead have got this um, long-acting um, uh, capsid inhibitor coming along. There's EFDA by Merck, 8591. And then there are monoclonal antibodies against CCR5 and against CD4. So there's quite a lot. And Ibalizumab has been, um, been licensed in the States, I think, now uh, for people with uh, multidrug-resistant HIV. So cabotegravir is going to be used for PrEP. So for those of you who are also interested in prescribing for PrEP, there may be long-acting injectables, and there are three studies going on at least at the moment using cabotegravir for PrEP. Why is that a good idea? Well, for some people, you have your injection, <laughs> you go off, and you can have sex, and you don't have to think about taking a pill. If you go to the sex party, take a lot of drugs, and you can't remember whether you've taken your pill or not, you have, because it's inside, right? So uh, again, for choice, if these trials work out, it'll be a good thing. And you can see the timelines at which some of these things are going to be uh, coming around, right? So we've recently had a press release here. There's stuff coming out all the time for all of these different compounds. So I think that... Uh, even though I'm talking about future therapies, it'll probably be near future for most of us. So there are some issues. So it's always great to have the positive publicity first, but now we have to get down to the reality of what we may have to do. So first of all, the dosing volumes for the treatment when you give rilpivirine and cabotegravir together are high. Three mils or more, it's similar to having the injections for syphilis, right? Uh, and you have to get, give them intramuscularly into the buttock. So after you've had that, make sure you don't have a long plane or train journey or you've got to drive a long way. All right, so the other thing is that after you take it, you've got to go back for more injections. Otherwise, the drug levels, if you stop having any more injections, the drug levels will slowly decrease, okay? And, if you're, uh, and then the virus can come out 
And if there's a slow level of drug and the virus comes out, you can select resistance, and that has been seen. Uh, the delivery of the injections is resource intensive. I'm gonna show a little table I made a bit later, requiring staff time and frequent patient clinic visits with a dosing frequency probably of every month. And the other thing is, you've gotta tell the patients, before you have an injection, please take the tablets. Because if you have an allergic reaction, to the injection, <laughs> that could be bad news. How are you gonna get that stuff out again, right, while you're having a terrible rash? It's in there for a month, so, or even longer. Cabotegravir can stay in your system up to a year. So you must make sure that you're not allergic to any injections you're gonna give. And with real pivorine, uh, it's got problems with drug interactions, so you're thinking about tuberculosis, imagine getting TB, then you've got to think, oh my, I'm already on treatment, no, I've got to just slightly change it now. And, uh, and it has to be kept in a fridge. So when you look at this, as uh, for lots of countries where cold chains aren't well kept, Northern and, and Eastern and Central Europe probably okay in the winter, but Southern Europe, <laughs> you've got to make sure the cold chain's all there, and you've got to make sure if you're going to do this in Africa or Asia, that you've got good electricity supply. So there are some individual problems that the patients will complain about or be concerned about. Injection site reactions or other possible side effects. Uh, also, if you've got to go every month to the HIV clinic, maybe it might increase the, you know, and someone says, hey, why are you going there every month, right? Whereas if you're going every six months to pick up pills, that's rather different. There may also be patient preference and acceptability. And some people saying, the control of my HIV is not, no longer in my hands, it's in your hands in a needle, okay? So there are all these things that it, you may feel it's liberating having injections every month, but also it could work the other way with some people's psychology. Because one thing you can't do is get inside other people's heads about how they feel about things. What we think about them and what they think about them may be very contrasting. Uh, the cost... Right, I will talk about, and as with all chronic diseases, the patient understanding of the need for the medication and the commitment to adherence. So is there a difference telling the patient you've got to take a tablet every day or saying to them you've got to come to the clinic every month, right? Will the adherence rates be any different? We don't know. So patient acceptability, I'm sorry this has looked a bit small, but basically what this shows is that uh, patients in the trial, in the LATE2 trial, who were given cabotegravir and rilpivirine, they were very happy with it, and they, wanted, they, they said they'd stay on it, most of them. Now, why is that? I'm a, I'm a patient in the clinic, and the physician comes up to me and says, hey, we've got a trial of a long-acting injection, or you carry on taking your pills. Do you want to join? If I go, I don't want any injections, no thanks, I don't go in the trial, okay? But that's my preference. That never gets reflected by the people who go in the trial, because the people who go in the trial think, hey, maybe injections are a good thing. So <laughs> you, you select people into a trial of injection therapy who might like injections or want injections. So although this is interesting to say that if you're one of those people, most people want to stay on it, that's great. But if you're asking me if you have a, a population, general population of HIV patients who would accept injections, I think that's a different study altogether. So please, when people show you this stuff, remember what, who they're asking the questions of. Uh, and, and this is uh, some more from uh, PrEP studies, basically injection site reactions and headaches were the two major problems, okay? So people went, ow, it hurts, and uh, I've got a problem, usually it wears off. It's nothing like T20, okay? You don't get all these big red patches. Uh, the diff and the real difference with uh, T20 is that you took that twice a day. So injection site reactions twice a day versus once a month is rather different, okay? Uh, so, but they are there, and headache. But as you can see, it's not too bad. Now, cost. Cost is really important. Now, why have I put this diagram here? And these are uh, kilo bags of sugar, right? So in a three-drug regimen over a 50-year period, sorry, these are how many kilos of drug you have to get. This is the yearly dose in grams. If you look at the long-acting, the yearly dose in grams is tiny, 
In fact, you take very little drug on board by using the injectables. And therefore, you would say, and, and most of the cost of drugs is from the raw ingredients. You're only taking six grams. So therefore, this should be a cheap therapy. The problem is the formulation, but once they've made that, that's okay, and the manufacturing and the production. And this may be one of the reasons, one of the few drug therapies where all of the manufacturing, the packaging and everything costs more than the raw drug. Okay, so the raw drug here, and in your lifetime, if you're looking at cumulative toxicity of drugs, in a lifetime you're taking very little drug compared with taking oral. So there is an advantage. Now, here's some modeling of cost. Now, this is from the US, but you could con convert this to your country. And the easy way to do it is, first-line therapy in the, U in the US, if it's less than 24,000 a year, that's your baseline. Now, in your country, it might be 4,000, might be 1,000, might be eight, okay? So they basically said the cost benefit, the price below which long acting remains cost benefit in first-line therapy, it's got to equal the same as your ordinary first-line therapy. That makes sense. In second-line therapy, you can see a little bit more, and in multiple prior failure, that they would, they would, they would say up to twice as much it could cost if you're going to use it in, in uh, multiple prior failure and still be cost-effective. So, this, so the one thing I must say, modeling, please tell me when modeling really told us uh, <laughs> the answer to any question, but it does give us a hint about the, the cost of this. It should be no more than what you're paying per annum for anything else. Now, knowledge gaps, things we don't know about this that we should ask people to find out for us or do ourselves. Drug interactions with hormonal contraception, right? So that's really important. Uh, hepatitis C, illicit use, uh, uh, chemsex drugs, antidepressants. There's a whole load of pharmacokinetic outcome data that we don't have. Well, they, this hasn't been given to children, pregnant or breastfeeding women, and we don't know about the populations of racial ethnic diversity, whether they're going to react or be the same as the mainly white gay men it's been given to. We got little um, about the preferences and acceptability, apart from what I've shown you there, and we need, as I say, I've talked about cost. Now, the optimal use of storage, shipment, all of this stuff needs to be worked out. Now, why is that important for you? Well, because you're about to start a whole uh, program of long-acting injections, and then the, the, the manager of your clinic says, the fridge is broken down, it's not arrived, we've got to keep it on some ice until somebody comes to fix this or that, or this, this batch is out of, out of date now, and what are we going to do, right? So you'll get all of those. Those problems are much more enhanced with injections, as you know, than they are with pills. Now, there are some system level problems. So first of all, they have to be approved and endorsed. And the guidelines committees have got to look at all this. But often when you look at guidelines, they're only looking at efficacy. Does it work or not? They're not looking at all the other challenges around drugs when they recommend stuff. Um, who are you going to give it to? Now, I've heard it's great for people with poor adherence. Yeah, well, if their poor adherence is a few days every month, yeah. But if their poor adherence is long term, then you give it to them. They don't come back in a month's time. Um, they've got drug on board, which is going down and down and down, and viruses coming up and up and up. So maybe poor, really poor adherent people, this isn't good for. Not unless you could get six monthly or annual injections. I think it'd be great for people who are dementing. I don't look at me too carefully. <laughs> because then they don't forget their drug and somebody could, somebody could visit them and administer it, et cetera, et cetera. So there are some patient characteristics that might be useful, but that we don't know who they are or determined. Obviously, People who want to go into trials of long-acting injection, they are great, right? But uh, we need to know in the general population who we're going to use it for. Um, you've got to train staff. Okay, now you're busy. You've got hundreds of patients coming through. Then suddenly long-acting's coming. You've got to train staff in preparing it getting it ready, checking it all off, injecting it, making sure everything's okay, all right? Making sure they've had the oral leading phase. All of this we do do with, with things, but we have to train staff. That's another burden to your healthcare to get this set up. Uh, I've talked about the supply chain and the cold chain. Oh, right. So other ones, right. 
drug resistance testing, that has to go on, right? And monitoring for safety during use. You give them an injection, what do you, what do, you do, even if they've had the oral pills, if they come in a few days after having an injection with a widespread rash? Mm, I don't really know, apart from, I've, I've thought maybe if you give them rifampicin, it might help because it'll metabolize it really quickly. But otherwise, it's a bit difficult, okay? It's a bit difficult to know. Uh, can you decentralize care? Well, if it's an intramuscular injection, you can't ask a partner to give it to somebody, right? That's a dangerous thing to do. They have to come to a clinic and be given it by a healthcare provider. So family doctors have got family nurses. They could probably do it, but they're gonna, they, maybe they'll say no. I don't know. So all of this needs to be thought about. Maybe you could go to your family doctor once a month and have the injection there. So education programs, we need to do that. We've done a lot on pills. When T20 came out, we did a lot of in, uh, information stuff. So we probably have to redo those again. And again, I've already said breastfeeding, hep C, all the rest we don't have. Now, here's an example of what might happen to your clinic. Now, imagine you've got 1,000 stable patients who are coming twice a year for bloods and medicine. They turn up. And I say, how are you? They're going fine. How's your dog? He's great. OK, right, next. Uh, yeah. No problems with the pills? No, here's this. Uh, here's your prescription. They go and get the pills, and they go home. And they have a blood test. Say it takes 30 minutes. So that's 1,000 people twice a year. That's 1,000 clinic hours of time. Right? So you're all prepared for that. Now, you, oh, sorry, you've got not patients, it's patients. 1,000 stable patients on injections come in six times a year. Well, it's really 12, actually, because if it's monthly, if it's two monthly, it's six. So I made it, maybe it's going to be two, but if it's six times a year at 30 minutes, that's 3,000 clinic hours. If they come monthly with the one that we've got at the moment, that's 6,000 clinic hours, <coughs> right? So suddenly, you've multiplied your visits in clinic by six for those stable patients. Now you've got to say, you've got to have room, you've got to have staff, you've got to have people doing this. It's got to be like a factory. And the problem for the patient is magnified. So don't forget them, because they've got to come regularly, rather than coming twice a year, oh, I'm coming down to London, I'll come and see you, doc. Yeah, they've got to go, every month? I've got to come every month? Can't somebody come to my house to do it? Can't my partner do it? Can my family doctor do it? So we have to think about what to do with them. So there are some things that might get over that. Long-acting implants, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have given a lot of money to a, a group in California to do this. They're very, what it looks like is, a, uh, you can see some pictures there, and some of them look even like a little metal smooth thing that you put inside. They could remain in place. You could reload them. That's one thing. Or you could remove them. If you're going to remove them, your clinic's got to be set up for minor operations because they've got to have a little minor operation to get it out, unless you get a special device that could. They could get stuck, right? All, you are just imagine you have to be prepared for all of this. Uh, okay, so the other problem is that in the states, they're regulated different to Europe. In Europe, if you want to get one of these through with drug in, you've got to both, you've got to get it through the drug and the device regulators. So they may approve the drug, not the device. They may approve the device, not the drug. You're in a mess then, right? In the states, they can do one, one or the other. And are generic people going to make this if it's too expensive? No profit margin for them? It's going to be, we don't know. Now, this is really cool. This is a long-acting oral. So what it is is a little device that should dissolve, and it's got all these arms, and that tr they can be triggered off at different times. They could have different drugs in or the same drug in. So you swallow it. It sticks in your stomach here. doesn't go through. And then it releases drug you know, bit by bit. And if it's the same drug, that's fine. This one could have cabotegravir, though. That could have real pivorine. That goes, that goes pow straight away. Then a few days later, these two go off, and then that goes off, right? So you just take that every often. So this is quite an interesting device that people are working on. And also, there are electronic drug delivery systems, either implants, swallables, all sorts of things that you can control from your uh, phone. It will also tell you whether or not how much drug's been released and all sorts of things. So you, you think that an in injection is a progress, right? Actually, this stuff is just space science. It's fantastic. And it's already been worked on for various illnesses and, uh, and uh, for therapies. 
So in conclusion, can we move away from daily oral therapy for HIV? Yeah, we can, but not for everyone, right? Some people will take pills. They'll go on injections. They'll go back to pills because they're fed up with the injections. Then they'll go, oh, look, I'm going away for a month. Uh, can I have the injection, please? And imagine going to countries where if you're found with HIV drugs, you can put in jail, well, have, well, we'll give you an injection, you go away for your month and come back after that, right? You don't have to worry about carrying pills through, through borders. All sorts of uses of, in, of these long actins could be used. Um, are they as effective? It looks so, so far from the data. What about toxicity? You've got to have the oral running to check that. Uh, is self-administration feasible? Not for an IM injection. Uh, is it desirable? Well, I think it would be in people you can train, but not for IM. Which patients would be candidates? I tell you, everyone will have their own idea about who's best for this. The best person to ask is the patient, right? <laughs> Are you okay with this? Do you think this is going to be good for you? Let's follow you through. Uh, how can resistance be prevented if patients miss doses? We've got to, you've got to chase them. You, they've got to make sure they've got an email, a mobile phone or something. You've got to chase them. Otherwise, we could be generating a uh, resistant virus. Can they be used as PrEP? We think so, but the data's not there yet. And do we have capacity to deal with this on a large scale? I think tomorrow, no. But in the future, we have to build up capacity if this is the way the field's going. With that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me.